You are welcome to this brief introduction to the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Most of the material that we shall discuss during this introduction can be downloaded from this website, hebrews.cura.download. Let's get into it. Although much of the material in this passage relates to antiquity, for generations Christian believers have clung to the promise that the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship and serve the living God. This text was written in Koine Greek sometime before 70 CE in the first century CE. We shall have something to say about Greek grammar in a moment. Although the text has been very well preserved over the centuries and through many copies, yet occasional changes were made by copyists. For example, in verse 1, a few ancient manuscripts read the word also instead of therefore or then. In verse 3, one manuscript, instead of holy place, reads holy of holies. In verse 10, a few ancient manuscripts insert and before the word regulations. And in 11, a few manuscripts replace good things to come with coming good things. And in verse 14, a few ancient manuscripts read your conscience instead of our conscience. Let's correct the spelling right now before we continue. As with most scripture, there is an important historical background. The Israelite tabernacle included a tent having two rooms called the Holy Place and the Most Holy Place, or the Holy and the Holy of Holies, separated by a curtain hung from four posts. Priests used to enter the holy place daily, attending a seven-branched lamp, placing fresh bread and burning incense. A high priest entered the most holy place once a year, where he sprinkled blood upon a covenant chest, making atonement with Yahweh for the people. A particular interest to Hebrews chapter 9 is the location of a golden incense altar. There are two dominant views. One view says that the incense burner was located in the holy place, in front of the curtain separating it from the next room. A second view places the golden incense altar in the most holy place on the other side of the curtain. There are good reasons for both of these views. As to the lexicon or vocabulary of this text, there are two terms that demand our attention. One in verse 5 is that of the cherubim, the plural of cherub. According to the Bidag lexicon, the cherubim, cherubim is an indeclinable word referring to the image of a winged creature that stood over the covenant box. The Dictionary of Deities and Demons makes the observation that the Israelite counterpart to the Sphinx, known from the pictorial art of the ancient Near East, in the Bible the cherubim occur essentially in two functions. First, as guardians of a sacred tree, or as guardians and carriers of a throne. The Sphinx, that is, the winged lion with a human head, and the biblical cherubim occur in precisely the same above-mentioned functions. The Syrian Sphinx throne was used for both gods and kings. A second term of special relevance to our passage is that of unintentional or ignorant sins. As a personal comment, under the first covenant, there were no sacrifices for individuals' intentional sins. It is Jesus' sacrificial death, quote, that redeems them from the transgressions 
committed under the first covenant, unquote, Hebrews 9.15, and, quote, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed it over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, unquote, Romans 3.25 and 26. Because some English translations make it seem that the golden urn containing the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant were in fact stored inside this ark, that is, the covenant chest. However, an important point of Greek grammar allows us to suggest a different interpretation. Greek nouns, adjectives, participles, and pronouns have number, that is, their singular or plural, and gender. They may be neuter, feminine, or masculine. Now, pronouns in Greek must agree in number and in gender with the nouns to which they relate. Thus, in Hebrews 9.2, the relative pronoun which relates to the holy place, and in 9.4, seems to relate to the most holy place. Thus, the holy place contained the table, the bread, and the lampstand, whereas the most holy place contained a jar of manna, Aaron's rod, the law tables, and the covenant chest. Thus, the text does not say that the covenant chest contained the jar of manna or Aaron's rod. We have tried to illustrate this in a grammatical diagram, which you can download from hebrews.cura.download. Careful Bible students pay as much attention to the structure or the logical outline of entire passages as they do to individual verses. Dr. Westfall, in her discourse analysis of our text, places it within a consideration of Jesus as the high priest whom we confess, with the exhortation to draw near to God, and in these verses, explaining how Jesus' ministry in the tabernacle cleanses the conscience of the believer. The grammatical or logical argument of these verses is developing the thesis that Christ's ministry is better. Verse 1, then, draws an inference. Therefore, or then, the first covenant ministry was temporary. And as an explanation, it points out that it had regulations and it had a priesthood. In contrast, from verse 12, Christ entered once for all into the holy places of heaven, with further explanations, including Christ's blood purifies our conscience, or our consciousness. As you study or read through this text, we recommend that you ask questions and then seek answers to your queries from Scripture and other sources. For example, in verses 1 through 2, you might ask yourself or ask others, what did the first covenant provide for Israelites? You should be able to discuss regulations and earthly sacred places. Secondly, what was inside the holy place? Pointing out that here was found the lampstand, a table, and loaves of bread. In verses 3 through 5, we ask, what was inside the most holy place? And here we learn that there was an incense altar, possibly, a covenant chest, a jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So where was the incense altar located? There are two views. View one, it was in the holy place near the central curtain. And view two, in the most holy place, near the central curtain. So, is there a mistake in the book of Hebrews? Well, maybe, maybe not. There are five theories as to what this is talking about. 
One theory says, well, there are mistakes in the Bible. Grow up and live with it. A second view says, well, no, there was a change of place. It was moved from one room to the other at some point in Israelite history. Then there's the textual variant theory that some ancient Hebrew manuscripts actually located the altar in the holy place, and they cite some Samaritan Hebrew manuscripts in support of this theory. Then there's the vague Greek grammar theory that our text in Hebrews is not actually saying so because some Greek words could be interpreted differently. And then there's the directional perspective theory that the writer of Hebrews, whilst talking about the most holy place, was looking back towards the holy place and viewed the altar as inside the most holy place. Those whom you teach or to whom you preach will certainly be asking, what are cherubim, cherubs? Well, cherubs are created divine beings that guard holy places from intrusion by defiled creatures, such as the cherubim, whom the Lord set as guards of the tree of life after the fall of Adam and Eve. Now, both the Bible and ancient pagans represented the cherubim with images of the sphinx, that is, a winged creature with a human face. In verses 6 through 10, we might ask, what were some weaknesses of the tabernacle system? You should be able to help others understand that we ordinary folk were not allowed to enter into the holy place. Secondly, that beast sacrifices could not perfect our conscience or our consciousness of sin. Thirdly, that the first tense was a kind of parable of the heavenly reality which was not yet open. So, when did the time of Reformation begin? Well, see verse 11. After reading verses 11 and 12, ask, in what ways is the heavenly reality better than the earthly? You should be able to cite reasons such as, 1. Christ has secured our eternal redemption. Secondly, by means of his own blood. Thirdly, once for all. Fourthly, as high priest of the good things that have now come. And in verses 13 and 14, we ask, what did the earthly system purify? And what does the heavenly one purify? Earthly purity was ceremonial, allowing priests to enter the first tent to render service, whereas the heavenly is spiritual, allowing us to serve the living God. And lastly, what is it that makes Christ's sacrifice permanent and once for all? Well, for one thing, Christ is an eternal spirit, thus making his sacrifice eternally efficacious. Secondly, we are no longer conscious of sin separating God from us. And thirdly, we all now serve the living God. As you teach through this passage, there are two historic Christian doctrines that are clearly taught. One is that of eternal redemption by the blood of Christ, and another, the worship of God with a pure conscience. Your assignment for this work includes homework. You are to read through Hebrews 9, 1 through 14, once a day this week, from different translations. As you do so, please jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in your Bible study group. As recommended projects, could you choose one of the following or, or another that interests you? Consulting Bible dictionaries, study Bible notes, and online web pages, make a sketch of the Israelite tabernacle and its furniture. Or perhaps, using the same tools, compile a list of all the offerings and sacrifices that Yahweh required of Israel along with where they were performed. 
After doing so, please prepare a one-page summary of your project and share it with your Bible study group. May God bless you richly as you learn this passage, as you obey this passage, and as you teach this passage to others.